Good morning, good morning, body of Christ. Yeah. It is such a wonderful blessing to be in your presence again on this yeah. Sunday morning. I don't know about you, but I love to call on the name of our King yeah. Jesus. Amen. Yeah. He's been wonderful. Yeah. He's been amazing.
Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. And he loves us in spite of what we do. Thank you, Lord. Why do we do the things we do when it hurts you? I'll never understand why. the pain we feel inside. I gotta make it right. I have nothing else to give except my life. Oh, please take care of my heart. I present my body, my sacrifice. Oh, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Running back to you. Oh, with my hands lifted high. 
Good morning and welcome to Body of Christ Church. And I am so glad that you're a part of this worship experience this morning. What a mighty God we serve and what, what a privilege it is to worship, to honor, and to glorify God. I thank all of you today for participating in this worship service. Pastor Delbert Watkins and the entire music ministry for blessing us in song as well. Listen, I've got a word from the Lord on your behalf for you. I pray that it would encourage as well as that it would challenge you as well. I want you to pick up in this fourth part and the final part of the series on pursuing or seeking hard after God. Pursuing and seeking hard after God. Let us pray. Father God, you are God alone. Be thou glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to turn to the Old Testament with me to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 15, beginning at verse 1 all the way through verse 7. I'm reading today from the English Standard Version. The Word of God reads as follow. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed, and he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. But when in their distress, they turned to the Lord the God of Israel, and sought him, he was found by them. In those times there were no peace to him who went out or to him who came in, for great disturbances afflicted all the inhabitants of the land. They were broken in pieces. Nation was crushed by nation and city by city, for God troubled them with every sort of distress. But you, take courage. Do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. On this Independence Day that we celebrate in the United States, as I look at this passage, I want to reflect especially in verses, verse 6. And it says, And they were broken in pieces. Nation was crushed by nation and city by city, for God troubled them with every sort of distress. But you, take courage. As I lift the text from this page, I'd like to use the sermon title, What's Going On? I can hear the words of Marvin Gaye Resonating in my ears, the lyrics from this very popular song. Mother, mother, there are too many of you that are crying. Brother, brother, there are far too many of you that are dying. You know, we've got to find a way to bring some loving here today. Father, father, we don't need to escalate you see, war is not the answer, for only love can conquer hate. You know we've got to find a way to bring some loving here today. Picket lines and picket signs. Don't punish me with brutality. Talk to me so you can see. Oh, what's going on? What's going on? Yeah, what's going on? What's going on? on. It was in May of 1971 when Marvin Gaye, the Motown artist, released this song entitled What's Going On? And he asked in this song a question that I believe was on the hearts and minds of all the people. The narrative in the song is told from the point of view from a Vietnam veteran and returning to his home country to witness the hatred 
the bigotry, the racism, the suffering, and the injustice. Marvin, Marvin was inspired by social injustices as well as uh, the uh, 1965 Watts riots and the assassination of even Dr. King. Marvin asked himself, and I quote, with the world exploding around me, how am I supposed to keep singing love songs? <laughs> What's going on? Barry Gordy, the founder of Motown Music, when he heard Marvin sing this song for the first time, he said, this is the worst song I've ever heard. And yet that song sold over two million copies and stayed on Billboard longer than any other song of that era. The world needed a song that addressed the issues of that day and the reality, especially that black people in America were facing every single day. It was the question everybody had on their mind. What's going on? Even for Marvin on April the 1st, 1984, he was fatally shot, succumbed to his death by his own father, Marvin Gaye Sr., while intervening in an argument between his mother and his far father. Really? What's, what's going on? It, it, it was a question that was raised, but if you notice, Marvin didn't try to give an explicit answer to the question. Matter of fact, very few have come up with the right answer to that question. Since then, we've had terrorist attacks, 9-11. We've had school shooting and mass shootings. We still have racism, hatred, bigotry. It continues to raise its venomous head. And yet we have black men being killed and women being killed by white police officers. We have black on black crimes. On top of that, we are living in a postmodern culture saturated in cultural relativism, secular humanism. There's no moral rule or standard of right and wrong anymore. We're caught somewhere in between relative truth and alternative facts. When it comes to God, there's a belief that God is whoever you want him to be. Whatever is relative to you, that is who God is or even God doesn't exist. And the Bible is a good book, but it is not the authoritative voice in the word of God. Jesus is a good man. He's a good teacher and a great philosopher. He's a miracle worker on demand. He's a savior, savior when you're in trouble, but not a savior for our sins because we don't have any. He's a prophet, but he is no master and he is no Lord today. We've got a heaven, but we don't have hell. And we wonder why the world is in such a mess and mess. And after 50 years after Marvin first asked this question, we are still asking ourselves this question. What's going on? Somebody tell me what's going on. I don't know if you realize it, my brothers and sisters, but we're living in a chaotic, confused, crazy, disorganized, traumatized, hectic, and painful world. What's going on? No, matter of fact, what's really going on? Let me try to answer the question of what's really going on today. Uh, I've got an answer. It, I believe it is the absolute correct answer, but I also have a solution. It's founded upon, solely upon the word of God. It is absolute. It is this unchanging, immutable truth that we have from the Bible, the written record that he has inspired himself. The first place I want to start is when we look and consider this text in 2 Chronicles chapter 15, there's a stated problem with the world. There's a stated problem with Israel, but the problem with Israel is the same problem that we're faced with today, some 1,500 years plus. There's really nothing new under the sun. Little is known about this name prophet, the prophet Azariah, as mentioned in the text. He is the son of Obed. But God gave 
his prophet a word to speak to King Asa, the king of Israel. And he gave him not only a word to say, but he gave him the courage to say it. Here's what I want you to notice right off the bat. God addresses the problem. He he addresses what's really going on in the world to the king, but he doesn't speak and he doesn't reveal the problem of what's going on to the king. Now, he doesn't do that through Congress or through Parliament. He doesn't do it through college professors and textbooks. He, he doesn't do it through sociologists, economists, or psychiatrists. Now, no, he got, God gives the ultimate answer to the question of what's really going on in this world through the prophet, through the preacher, i.e. through the church, the voice and the representation of God himself in the earth. Here's the problem then. And my brothers and sisters, I submit to you, here's the same problem today. It's found in verses 5 and verse 6 of the second portion of uh, Chronicles chapter 15. Notice what he says. In those times, there was no peace to him who went out or to him who came in for great disturbances afflicted all the inhabitants of the land. They were broken in pieces. Nation was crushed by nation and city by city, for God troubled them with every sort of distress. I love the message translation. Eugene Peterson says, at that time, it was a doggy dog world. Life was constantly up for grabs. No one, regardless of country, knew what the next day might bring. Nation battered nation, city plummeled city. God let loose every kind of trouble among them. Notice what happened when the people of Israel turned their backs against God. I'm going to say it again. There was no peace to those who came in and those who went out. There were great disturbances that afflicted the inhabitants of the land. They were broken in pieces Nation against nation, city against city, God troubled them with all sorts of distress. When we look at this text, we, it identifies what the real problem is today. But when we look at this and we read it, that's not the real problem. Nation against nation, distress, city against city, one per, a people group against another. Those are just the, actually the results of the effects of the real problem. I can hear someone saying, Rev, so what is the real problem? I'm so glad you asked. The real problem, listen to me carefully, the real problem then and now is God. Now you're going to need to write that down. The real problem then and even now is God. Yeah, you heard me right. God is their problem and God is our problem. I think you skipped over something in verse six. If you read it again, it says they were broken in pieces. Nation was crushed by nation and city by city. And we wonder how did this happen? Who did all of this for God troubled them with every sort of distress for God troubled them with every sort, I'm going to say it again, for God troubled them. That's their trouble. That's their problem. God troubled. God did it. God did. You see, lean in, my brothers and sisters, because you're probably looking right now. I know you just woke up in the morning and hadn't had your coffee, but you, you're probably going, why does God trouble them and trouble us? You see, when we don't do things God's way or when God is not in the center of our lives and our decision making and when God is not our priority, then God can create some real problems for us. Have you ever noticed that when Israel turned their back against God and they turned to the the false gods and the idols of their world, they had to answer, listen to me carefully, to the wrath of God. That was the problem then. It's the problem now. That's really what's going on. 
It is the wrath of God being unleashed. That's the reason why we see the racism, we see the bigotry. That's the reason why we've got so much hatred in this world. That's the reason why there's so much violence. That's the reason why there's no standard for morality, men loving men and women loving women. And, and people just, again, have no sense of code of conduct whatsoever. It's the wrath of God then, the wrath of God now. Let me talk about that wrath of God. You see, there's two types of wrath of God. There is the active wrath of God. Then there is the passive wrath of God. And yet both of them are the wrath or the results of God's anger when the people that he have created turn their backs on him and turn to idol gods. In the Old Testament, we see several acts of uh, God's act of wrath. I mean, throughout the Old Testament, we see earlier on that God destroys the Tower of Babel. We see also that God causes rain to fall on the earth and to flood out and to destroy human lives. We see God in his act of wrath in the Old Testament destroying the city and the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, including Lot's family. We see Pharaoh's army being swallowed up in the Red Sea as a result of God's act of wrath. We see Israel's judgment in the wilderness and how thousands died because of their unbelief or because Christ or God wasn't at the center of their lives. Israel was taken into Babylonian captivity because of God's act of wrath. And so when we look at this, we see in the Old Testament there, from, from Genesis to Malachi, there is the wrath, active wrath of God. But in the New Testament, we've got Christ comes on the scene. Christ, the Savior, the Redeemer, but he's also the one, the sacrificial lamb who makes propitiation on our behalf so that he could satisfy the wrath of God. And so therefore, we now see a passive wrath, but yet there is still a wrath. In Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 25, Paul speaks about God's passive wrath against those who reject God and they turn to idols. He says, therefore, God gave them up. God gave them up. That's passive wrath. God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth of God about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Then look at verse 28, verses 28 through 31. And since they did not fit to uh, acknowledge, they see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up. God gave them up to a debase, that means a corrupt, a degraded and polluted mind to do what ought not to be done. What did it look like, Paul? They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder. I'm talking about what's really going on. Strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossipers, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and even ruthless, he says. Here's the key. Here's the key. It's a sad key, but here's the key. And God turned them over and God gave them up and God turned them over and God gave them up. It's God's passive wrath. He says, I'm not going to send lightning down from heaven anymore. I'm not going to send rain. I'm not going to destroy a people in the wilderness. This is what I will do, though. I'll just step back and let you destroy yourselves. I'll let you murder yourselves, rape, incest, drug addictions, alcoholism, gossip, backbiting, robbery. I'll let you destroy yourselves. That's actually God's wrath against those who choose willfully not to acknowledge him and to make them first, him first in their lives. The prophet Azariah tells King Asa, 
what this problem was really with God or what caused this problem with God. We see what the problem is. The problem is God and God's wrath against those who reject him. But what caused the problem? That's the second thing. What led Israel to this problem called God? The prophet speaks about the spiritual condition of Israel even before he spoke about the problem itself. I know I'm taking the text out of this, this uh, out of order and, and hermeneutically I may be correct, but uh, homiletically I'm uh, make, making sure I rearrange this text so that I can give you the problem first and then we can talk about the solution. What led Israel to this problem called God? Well, old prophet, again, he speaks about the spiritual condition of Israel in verses three through four. And it tells us the cause or how they got to this problem called God. This is what it says in verses three and four. He says, for a long time, Israel was without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. Listen what happened. But when in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel and sought him. He was found by them. Three things I see concerning their spiritual condition. First of all, Israel was without the true God. <laughs> they were without the true God. Now, it wasn't that they didn't have a God or gods. It wasn't that they weren't worshiping. It wasn't that they didn't believe even in the true God, but he became a competitor. The question is, who did they worship? And who did they believe and put their trust in? Who did they put their confidence in? Where was their allegiance, their allegiance into who they turned and they served? Idol gods, my, my, my. We talk about the subject of idolatry and yet America, the world for that matter, is filled with idolatry. Augustine, the African preacher of Hippo, said this way regarding Adultery, he says, idolatry is worshiping anything that ought to be used or using anything that ought to be worshiped. That's really what idolatry really is. And I find ourselves that even ourselves that 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 we have a tendency uh, to to worship things that are only supposed to be used. But at the same token, we use and misuse the true God. William Barclay makes an important observation about ancient idolatry, and he said it this way. He said, the essence of idolatry is the desire to get. <laughs> A man sets up, he says, an idol and worships it because he desires to get something out of God. To put it bluntly, Barclay says he believes that by his sacrifices and his gifts and his worship, he can persuade or even bribe God into giving him what he desires, end of quote. Today, is that not our culture and the people and the culture that we live in? Uh, is, is that not, a, it's not that people don't believe in God today for the most part. It, it's just that they want their tailor-made God. They want a custom God that, that they can build. And let me just say it, that we can build to our own specs. They want a God that they can create for their own personal benefit, their own personal satisfaction, like a marionette puppet that they can control and master over. That's dangerous. It's extremely dangerous. Today, people want to discount God, but they want high div uh, paying dividends. They want a part time God with full time benefits. They, it's, we live in an adulterous society and culture. And it's made its way even into the church where now the culture is dictating the values and the focus of the church instead of the church setting the agenda for the world and the culture. They had a God, but it was the wrong God. They were without God. The second thing, the problem that they had or what caused the problem, which is God and his wrath, is that Israel was out without teaching priests. <laughs> they didn't have preachers that were teaching the word of God. 
The priest's role was not only in those days to perform temple duties, but also they were supposed to go all about uh, throughout the tribes of Israel, teaching the people from God's word, from the scriptures, from holy writ. The problem wasn't that the word of God was corrupt from the very first canon of scripture. The Bible has always been accurate and it has always been the authoritative voice of God. So the problem wasn't that the word of God had been, was, in itself was polluted, but the problem or the cause of the problem was that the priests were watering down and polluting the word of God for the satisfaction of the people and for their own selfish pride and gain. It seems like I'm seeing that repeated all over again today. Today we have that same problem from the pulpit, from the church. If you don't mind me saying this respectfully, but it is the truth. We're either preaching a self and self-centered gospel, a prosperity gospel of materialism and greed. Get all you can get in Jesus name, a legalistic gospel that puts people in chains and causes leaders to govern over them as masters, the gospel of works and merit for our salvation instead of grace. And then we preach a gospel of cheap grace that God loves us and God is gracious and forgiving. So live any kind of way you want to. We're preaching the gospel of sensationalism. We're preaching the gospel of pride, arrogance, and self-reliance and the gospel of anything goes because God is love. The problem that, that was caused that brought on the wrath of God is because the preachers weren't preaching. <laughs> Seldom today do we hear the Christ-centered, God-glorifying, self-denying, kingdom-saturated, Lordship gospel of Jesus Christ in the church today. The gospel is about Jesus is really not about us. We become benefactors, if you will, uh, or beneficiaries of God's gospel and the sacrifice of Christ. But it is for his glory and for the preeminence of Christ. The third problem is that Israel was without law. They were without the law or the standards of God. Well, if you don't have truth, if, if, if you're absent of the truth from God's word and the truth is not being preached and then you're worshiping the wrong God, that leads to the absence of, uh, of the law of God, the standards of God. And so then you have an insane society, a culture that is in chaos, a, a world at war, a perplexed people. We have truth that's transitional. We have morals that can be manipulated and we got a God that can be governed by the people, for the people. That's what happens. Wrong God, preachers not preaching the truth. And then we are a lawless people. That's the culture that we live in today. Just like Israel lived in that culture, it's a repeated culture with a different twist to it today. We're really mastered by the cultural norms of today. The culture really is unavoidable. It's really the air that we breathe. We talk about culture and we make it common, but what is really, what really is culture? Well, culture can be defined. Miriam Webster says, and I quote, the integrated pattern of human knowledge, belief, and behavior that depends upon the capacity for learning and transmitting knowledge to succeeding generations. Not only that, but secondly, stay with me now. Miriam Webster says it's the culture is the set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterizes an, an institution or organization. My brothers and sisters, we live in a postmodern era, postmodern religion that ac uh, acknowledges and accepts different versions of truth. For example, when it comes to beliefs, rituals, and practices, it can be in invented, it can be transformed and created and reworked based on constantly shifting and changing realities, individual preferences and myths, legends, models, rituals. 
and even cultural values and beliefs. We have, we, we, we have to, if you will, especially as Christians, we have to set a value to culture. And how we do that is what we watch and what we embrace and what we're entertained by and what we pre, uh, uh, repeat and what we tweet. We have to set a value to culture so that it, culture doesn't dominate our priorities and our perspective. Because the reality is culture shapes our thinking and our value system. You can't get around it. It has an effect on our values and on our thinking and on our decision making. Even as, especially as Christians, it is vital for us to be to give careful consideration about the, the sort of effects that culture has on us. Culture will even dictate or at least determine the way people hear a sermon and even the way the sermon is preached. Culture alters, alters what people expect on Sunday morning in the worship experience or determines whether or not the worship experience should even be on Sunday mornings or if there should even be a public in-service, in-person worship experience. The culture, you can't get around it. You just can't get around it. We see the culture some 1,500 years ago in this text in Second Chronicles. and We can see the influence and the power of the culture today and how it affects the church. Let me get to my third and final consideration. I'm not going to ask the question what's going on and give the answer, but I don't give a biblical solution. I don't give the solution that God gives because then I might as well just be an R&B or soul songwriter. The solution <clears throat> is God has the solution. <laughs> Look at verse 2. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you while you are with him. Are y'all listening to that? If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. The solution really, it's, a, it's abiding in God. It's abiding in Christ, having presence with Christ, a relationship with him. The prophet Azariah, he speaks to King Asa, who had just returned from and with his mighty battle, uh, a mighty uh, army in the battle against the Ethiopians and defeating them. I can see, see King Asa, his pride is rising up, the fighting men with him, the, the chests are poked out, the, the celebrations of victories in the street and and yet the self-sufficiency, this self-sense of security begins to run throughout Israel. I can hear them saying, nobody can stand against us. But then God says, slow your roll, slow your roll. First of all, you've been successful not only today, but all throughout the years because of me, because I was with you. I was with you. As a matter of fact, God says, even when you weren't with me, but that's about to end if it doesn't change. God tells Asa, here's how it works. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you, Asa, while you are with him. And if you seek him, that's what we're talking about, pursuing God. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. My brothers and sisters, the solution to the world's problem today is just, to return to God, draw near to him. For the church, we need to be revived by God, seeking God, thirsting after God, having a hunger for God, desiring God above all. Now God is, we know, is the one who pursues us. <laughs> he pursues us, but when he pursues us, he draws us, we must come. That's where the seeking takes place. It's mutual. God initiates, but we need to respond and reciprocate. In Acts chapter 17 and 17 from the NIV translation, the word of God reads and says, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. He is pursuing us, but he expects us to seek him. And in the seeking, reach out for him, and there we will find him. Jeremiah 29, 13, in the Old Testament, God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. 
That's what it's all about. It's not just reading pages of scripture. It's not just hearing the sermon. It's not just listening to gospel songs, patting your feet, clapping and giving your testimony, even giving your tithes. He says, if you seek me, if you desire me, you hunger after me, I'm your priority. You'll find me. But you got to seek me with all your heart, your whole heart. <clears throat> but notice the text says, that it was in their distress that the people turned to God. <laughs> Have you ever understood how just how gracious it is? How did God draw them, the presence of God? How was he drawing them to seek him? He created distress. He created a problem. He created difficulty. One nation against another, city against a city, people going out, they have no peace. People coming in, they have no peace. One group against another. Let me say it again, racism, we, we, uh, uh, classism, sexism, we got it all. Hatred, bigotry. Where does it come from? We know what the cause is, but God's wrath is the problem. But why does God send that wrath so that we will turn to him in our distress. He's just that gracious to use his either his passive or active wrath to drive us to him. And we're being driven by his love and compassion because the reality is he could just wipe us out. In their distress, they turn to God. Maybe some of you are going through that distress right now. We've got COVID, we've got everything else, and it seems like we're so perplexed, so overwhelmed. Maybe God is saying, I'm trying to draw you with my love, draw you into a close and intimate relationship with me. <laughs> the world is stressed out, if you haven't noticed. I talked about the solution. The solution is seeking God, pursuing God even in our distress, that we might find him and make him number one in our lives. But let me go and take it a step further. How will the world find God? <laughs> they find God through the church. The church is the only, only institution, the only entity that God has created through Christ Jesus, that God might be revealed to a lost world. The church should be seeking the lost. And while we're seeking God, we should be seeking the lost as well. The church is where people should find Christ. We're the salt. We're the light of the earth. That's what God says about us in Christ Jesus. We're the salt. We're the light. Salt causes the decay to stop. This is a decaying world. Not only that, but we're the light in the midst of darkness. People are walking in darkness, bumping into things, even bumping into dangers and death. The church is the salt. Every Christian is salt and light in Christ Jesus sent out into the world. You're light and salt on your job, in the school, in the community, in the marketplace. You're not just a teacher in the classroom uh, 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 teaching uh, uh, from the textbook, but you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ, a representative of Christ, a reflection of Christ. You're not just a factory worker or a doctor or a nurse. You're not a, just a truck or a bus driver. You're an ambassador of Christ. This world is not your home. You're working in God's embassy on the earth. That's why we say your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven because we are your ambassadors. And the church is the embassy. When you're in a foreign country and the crap about to break out, <laughs> one of the first things you want to do is you want to get to your home embassy in that country because there you know you can be protected, you'll be sheltered. But at the same token, we understand there's a conduct that we must carry out because we're representing our country and our embassy in that country. And so therefore we have to realize that Christ has given us the keys to the kingdom. We are the ones who have the keys, if you will, through the gospel message and through our testimony and sharing Christ, that others might enter into the kingdom of God. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Have you ever lost your keys? Been searching all over the house and the car down in the seat for your keys? Sometimes it's not that we've lost our keys. Sometimes and every now and then, every couple of years, I have to clear some keys off my key ring because 
I've got some keys on there. I don't even know what locks they go to. I've forgotten. I think that's the church's challenge today. We've lost our keys. And if we haven't lost our keys and understand that we are the gateway, if you will, for people to come to know Christ as their savior. We are the gateway for people to seek and to be saved by Christ. Either we've lost our keys and we just got so many keys on the key ring that we've forgotten what it is that we're supposed to be doing. God has given the church the keys to the kingdom, just like he gave Daniel and the three Hebrew boys a testimony as a witness to the king of Babylon. Just we should be like Rahab to the was to the spy, saving them alive. We should be like John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus Christ in his second return. We should be like Moses to Israel in the in, in Egypt. We should be like Joseph was to his brothers. Yet we should be the vessels of Christ that lead others in seeking and saving and and pursuing Christ Jesus. And I know some of you are asking the question, why should we, the, the church, be concerned about the lost in this world? After all, Jesus Christ is soon to come back. Well, that's just like saying, why should you exercise and why should we eat nutritional foods and drink water? Because Christ is soon to return and we're gonna die anyway. We have come to the conclusion that the people in the world are either unsaved, they either don't want to know Christ or uh, they choose to reject him. And so therefore, there's no hope and there's a waste of our time. But let me tell you, let me remind you of something in case you have forgotten. Somebody took the time out to share Jesus Christ and the gospel with me and with you. Somebody took the time out, not only the preacher in the pulpit, but mama, granddaddy, somebody took the time out. To share that good news with us. As Peter said about the church, the church is the pillar and the ground of God's truth. We are the foundation of God's truth. Do we realize that the people in the world that is absent of truth, that have altered truth, they are still searching for the truth. And if the world overcomes and succumbs to the culture, then where will the world find and the culture find? God's truth. (laughs) In closing, there was a man who approached the Little League baseball game one afternoon as a spectator, and he asked a little boy in the dugout, he asked him what was the score. The boy responded and said, 18 to nothing, we're behind. The boy said to the, 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 uh, excuse me, the man said to the boy, he said, I bet you're discouraged. The player looked up to the man and said, why should I be discouraged? We haven't even gotten up to bat yet. (laughs) If only the church would have that attitude, that perspective, if only the church would have that optimism, that anticipation, that hope that, yes, this is a jacked up world. We're not trying to save the whole world but it's one person at a time. And if only we knew that, yes, it looks like we're behind, but that can change when we step up to bat. It can change when we go out and leave the church building and become the church. Listen, the world is not going to be saving those who are lost in the world by Christians coming to church, but they'll only be saved when the church leaves the building and goes to the rest of the world. I say to you, my brothers and sisters, keep on seeking God, keep pursuing him. We ask ourselves what's going on in the world. We ought to know. We ought to know what the answer is and who is the solution. But let us lead the way. Let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks and we praise you. God, thank you for your word and your absolute truth. God, I thank you today, O oh Father, for those, Lord, under the sound of my voice that have been affected by the power of your gospel. I can hear Paul say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it truly is the power of God unto salvation. God, I pray today you break down the strongholds, that you would loose the chains and the fetters on this day of liberty, O Father, and give us true inner peace and liberty through Christ and Christ alone. If there's anyone, O Father, that's listening Lord, that may not know Christ as their Savior, 
Help them to realize all have sinned and come short of your glory. But today, if they trust Christ Jesus, Lord, as their Savior, oh Father, he will not only forgive them, but live and abide in their lives from this day and forevermore. Lord, I pray today, oh Father, that they would open up their hearts, invite Christ in, Lord, and trust him, oh Father, to be saved, to be born again. Lord, for the rest of us who name the name of Christ, I pray today, oh Father, that we would be the church, the active church, that we would be that salt, that light that you've designed, oh Father, not to be under a lampshade, not to be in a glorified salt shaker called the church building, but salt to be poured out, oh Father, into the rottenness of this world, and to be light in the darkest, most dense places in this world, that others might see our good works, our loving kindness, our humanity, hear the glorious gospel message, and that ultimately you might be glorified, that you might be glorified, and that we would all receive our ultimate joy and satisfaction and security when you are glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless all of you. Thank you so much for your time and your attention today. Listen, if we've been a blessing to you, let us know. Post your comments. You can even inbox us if you so choose. Uh, if, if any way, again, that we've been a blessing to you, let us know that. That's encouraging to us. And not only that, not only myself, but uh, the music ministry and those who serve so faithfully. But not only that, this coming Sunday, this coming Sunday, we are going back to our in-person service. That's right. And we're taking the precautions and uh, all of the COVID protocol. And I am highly encouraging uh, all of you, whether you're coming back tonight or uh, tonight, <laughs> whether you're coming back next Sunday, uh, for our in-person service, but I highly encourage you to consider if you have not to take the vaccine, the COVID vaccine, and uh, if it's not just protecting yourself, it's protecting the loved ones around you. And, uh, and so again, I wanna uh, thank all of those who've been working behind the background to make this upcoming service uh, a reality. Now we're, we're only, we're coming in at less than 20% uh, of our seating capacity. It's not by government standards, it's what we wanna make sure this is our first Sunday back that we got everything in place. And, and again, that uh, we, we set up everything up for your safety as well as for your convenience and in, uh, in this worship experience. The next Sunday, we will open up that capacity even more. So I know some of you, matter of fact, have already registered and the registration is already filled for this coming Sunday. I believe that's July the 11th, uh, just a 10 o'clock service. But we will be live, live streaming the service. So. Again, uh, if you're not here, you can still, just like you're watching it today, you can watch it live stream. The following Sunday we will open up and then soon we will have, go back to two services, eight and 10, but for now, just a 10 o'clock service. So I wanna say again, thanks, a big thanks to everyone. We have cleaned professionally, had Professor clean all the seats, the carpets, everything uh, in the church to make sure uh, that it is safe uh, coming back in our return. It's been 15, 16 months since we've been uh, in the house. <laughs> and so again, I wanna thank everyone again for working and serving your faithfulness during this time as well. Speaking of faithfulness, don't forget to give in the offering today. As God has blessed you, let our giving be an expression of our worship and thanksgiving unto God, a sense and heart of our gratitude, as well as to know that we're sowing into the ministry so that we can be a blessing to others as well. If you'd like to give online, that's all you need to go do is go to our website, which is bodyofchristchurch.org, bodyofchristchurch.org, and you can give on that home page. There, just click that giving or that offering button. It's safe, convenient, and it's secure. So God bless you again, and thank you for your faithfulness and, uh, and your contributions. And I wanna thank you all of you for your prayers as well. Let's continue to pray for one another. I'm so looking forward to seeing you on next Sunday by the grace of God. Until then, remember that I love you, but God loves you a whole lot more.